climb the mountains. And without trading, it's almost impossible because I travel almost six months a year. The money, the fa as fast as it comes, it can go away faster. It's just you're one bad trade away from just being broke. Like life, you can't chase everything. You have to accept that, okay, there are things that is happening and you're not part of it. We have to do something. We have to keep fighting for something. Andrew Aziz is a multi-passionate entrepreneur with a passion for making trading better for everyone. He started his career with a PhD in chemical engineering and has since then gone on to become a trader, investor, and the number one best-selling author. His books have been published in 12 languages, and some of you may know his most popular book, How to Day Trade for a Living, which is named the best trading book by Investopedia and Business Insider. The book provides strategies on how to day trade in the modern stock market. When he's not trading, writing, or running his multiple businesses, Andrew is in the mountains skiing or mountaineering. He's currently on a mission to climb the highest volcano in each of the seven continents. Please welcome my friend, Andrew Aziz. Don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe to hear more stories like these. Welcome, Andrew. Welcome to the show, Humble Traders. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan of your work and I'm excited to talk to you. We are both in Vancouver and uh, before, I think I met you last year when I went to visit your office. Before then, I, I thought I knew you were in BC, but I never thought you were like two blocks away. <laughs> Yeah, so I knew I, I knew you were in Vancouver as well, uh, mm -hmm. but you just never had the contact. And you know, I should have actually reached out to you and say, "Hey, let's meet up." But thanks for uh, arranging that. And yes, we met first time traders for cause, mm. and then after that, you came to the office. That was a good time. Yeah, your office is amazing, by the way. So much space, and your team is so big. I was like. Oh. I thought it was just one dude trading from your home. <laughs> well, <laughs> like trading me. is still the one person, but we are building that uh, trading terminal. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, most of them are developers and there are two traders in there. So, um, mm. but it's good to have an office. I love yeah. uh, having an office and I hate working from home. Oh, really? Yeah. That's funny because that's most traders dream to work from home, being in pajamas and like your office, like two steps away from your bed. I don't know. I mean, we live in an apartment. I live in an apartment in mm -hmm. Vancouver and it's a small. I love to have a space. If I were living in, in a big house, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I had my own big office and everything. But mm. I hate to have a very small den and uh, trading from a, a very small office. How long have you been in Vancouver? Did you immigrate here? Yeah, so I did. Uh, so in 2008, I came for a uh, study. Okay. I did my PhD in chemical engineering in UBC, University of British Columbia. Uh, so I was an international student. And then after that, I was eligible to apply for a skilled worker. And then after mm. the skilled worker, become permanent resident and citizen. So that path, yeah. So Vancouver is my home. Okay, and so that's 2008. 2008. And you graduated? In 2012. 2012, okay. And did you have like a former formal career after you graduated? Yeah, so I did start work as an engineer in uh, two mm -hmm. different companies, uh, working on hydrogen fuel cells and electric cars, but with hydrogen, not with lithium batteries. So there was okay. a research center in Bernabe for a German car company like Daimler and Mercedes-Benz. Okay. So we're working on that, but I got laid off from that job in 2015 or 13. Mm. And uh, that's how I actually really got uh, more serious into trading and learning how. And before that, I really didn't have any money. So mm. the trading for me or investing for me was irrelevant because as a student, I really didn't have any money. But oh. when I started working, I had some cash to mm -hmm. play around with it. So your first approach, like the first time you had a taste in the market, it's not from investing or swing trading. It's just you dove straight into day trading. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I started with swing trading. Okay. Everybody starts, oh, buy Apple, buy this, buy yeah. that. So we all got into that. But uh, after that, uh, you know, so, OK, I want more. You know, let's trade mm. that. It goes up. You want to sell it. And then you sell it. OK, well, what should I do now? I have to buy it again. So everybody starts with swing trading. The first book that I read was Swing Trading for Dummies. Uh, it was actually a really good book. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it was a really good book. I remember book. the yellow book uh, yeah. with the... Okay. Most of them were they're not uh, great, but uh, Swing Trading for Dummies were actually really good. Really? The author okay. was Omar Basal. He's a fund manager in uh, Kuwait. He's actually a really mm, good guy. Okay. So it was really well written. And God hooked me, hooked me up with trading. Mm. And then that was the time that the whole day trading started picking up. Mm. Everybody tries to get into the market. And then I started 
day trading and play around with it and lost a lot of money and a story that everybody has you know, at the beginning. Mm. So you were day trading part time before going to work until you got laid off. Yes, that's oh, correct. So I was okay. trading. I was day trading uh, part time and then I got laid off. And then uh -huh. for five months when I was unemployed, I started really uh, working uh, on day trading. And I said, OK, I'm going to make this. I'm going to make a lot of money. Hundred dollar, two hundred dollars a day, three hundred dollars a day. It didn't really work out well. So I had to get another job. Okay. And uh, I kept that job, um, but I still waking up early and try to uh, at least trade for until mm. eight eight thirty. That's more. That's the time that I'm trading. Okay. So for the first two hours of the market. Yeah, I think that's the the beauty of living on the West Coast in yeah. Vancouver, Los Angeles, or any anywhere along like the West Coast where you can you can start trading at six thirty a.m. and be yeah. down at eight thirty and then go to work at nine nine thirty and like trading part time is very very possible here. Yeah, that's I think one of the uh, successes that I have in trading was the time zone. Mm. If I was in the New York time or Eastern time zone, I wouldn't be able to. Yeah, that would be tough unless you are able to negotiate with your job and like start way later. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you actually officially become a full-time trader? 2018. So mm. I, in 2015, when I got laid off, 2016, I started a new job for two years, a year and a half, almost two years, I kept that job, but I was trading on the side. And then officially in 2018, I gave the notice and I said, I don't want to work there. Although uh, it was a really good uh, job, it was really okay. difficult for me, but I said, okay, it's not worth it. No. I want to travel the world now. <laughs> oh, so I quit okay. that in 2018. Do you enjoy travel trading? Have you been doing that a lot? I've done that a lot since 2018. Well, I got my citizenship Canadian passport in 2018. Before mm, that, I'm perfect from, timing. Perfect timing, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I, that was one of the reasons that, okay, now I can travel. Before that, with the, my uh, previous passport, I couldn't really tra travel that much. Mm. I need to get visa and everything. It was difficult. Uh, and then, yeah, from 2018 until now, I traveled a lot. I traveled a lot even during the pandemic. Mm. Uh, that was really fun, too. Oh, was it was it easy to travel during COVID and bring in your laptop and everything? Yeah, it was it was a little bit painful because you had yeah. to do all the, the COVID testing. And then when you come back, you had to do the isolation and uh -huh. stuff. But it was awesome because nobody was traveling oh. in that time. Everywhere I go, there's nobody there. And, you know, all the tourist traps were empty. And I uh -huh. love that. Yeah. Oh, that's like literally the trader dream, I think. Yeah. Travel, trade and like be remote, that lifestyle. I think a lot of traders want that. Yeah, it depends on what people want. For me, traveling and see the world the mm -hmm. way that I want has always been uh, my goal. Like, I don't want to go, you know, travel the way that most of the people have to because they have to only Christmas time and then they have to take a cruise. It's, yeah. I wanted to see the world the way that I want, like go into the small villages, climb the mountains. And without trading, it's almost impossible because I travel almost six months a year. Mm. And uh, so I really needed uh, that. And uh, I think it's a very nice lifestyle, but I don't think anyone would enjoy that. Like my uh, my family members, they don't like to travel that much. They mm -hmm. like to have a, you know, beach lifestyle or very laid back lifestyle. Uh, I love to travel to see different cultures, cuisines mm -hmm. and place, yeah, places. Yeah, I think trading is one of those careers that enables you to do that. You just need yeah. one good internet, uh, which is kind of tricky <laughs> it sometimes to get. It has to be really good internet. <laughs> yeah, it know. has to be. It's a lot of hit and miss. Like I've been to very remote area in Ecuador, mm -hmm. like like middle of literally nowhere. And I had the best internet in my life I've seen. What? And then I go in Paris and I can't even connect to my platform. It's just for <laughs> some reason, it's just the internet is so bad. Uh, it's very hit and miss. Like That's in so funny. Some of the very uh, cheap hostels, really good internet. And then you go to the best Ritz Carlton Hotel, and there's bad Wi-Fi. I don't know. It's, I just don't get it. It's really hit and miss when you're traveling. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's that's interesting. Yeah, for me, I was in Ecuador, for example, during the Christmas time. It was in 2000, 2021, I think. And it was around the time that there was another wave of COVID. Yeah. And uh, they tried to lock down. They closed the border. I was already in there. So I mm -hmm. went to climb the mountain. It was a small uh, hut. And in that hut, uh, they had internet. And usually <laughs> in the internet is good for Yeah. They would usually they have internet bandwidth for a lot of people. But because there was nobody... Um. I had the best internet. That's why there was the maximum bandwidth that I could ever see. That it was amazing. Yeah. So you were trading on high altitude. High altitude. It was like <laughs> five thousand meter of trading and oh screen God. sharing and video and everything. Oh my was God, awesome. that's so funny. <laughs> and how did you do? Did you do you find that you trade better high on the mountain? 
Uh, no, actually, <laughs> most of my trails at the high mountains. Are clear. I'm gonna go to Everest, and I want to climb as high as possible when I have the internet. Well, that's a good test. Oh. Maybe if I can do that at six thousand meter, that would be nice. Oh my god! Yeah, do the internet test, the speed test for everyone watching this, in case they wanna go to Everest and trade. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> okay, so for those who don't know, Andrew is an avid mountaineer, and is it true that you're on a mission to try to try to climb the highest? volcano on every continent that is uh, the plan yes okay how many have you done so far four uh, four, four? Yes. meanwhile i'm just chilling my little lemon pants on my whistler climbing my little trails that's what you enjoy <laughs> people have different things for yeah. me mountains what i like about mountains is humbles me mm. like a humble like like you're humble trader because the market has humbled you yeah and we are this is a humble traders podcast because yes. everybody in the market has always been humble mm -hmm. what i like about mountain is humbles me in life when you can see the huge mountain mm -hmm. and you feel nothing in front of it i like that it reminds uh. me of how insignificant i am that's what i like about it i like that yeah just yeah. like how we are all technically so insignificant in the market so as well. insignificant, no one yeah. cares mm -hmm. about your your 10,000 shares. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people say, oh, market makers are one of my stop losses, heat on that. I don't believe in that. I don't think mm. market makers are sitting to see one my 200 uh, shares to get my uh, data stop loss. I think a lot of it is just people trying to find excuse for their uh, losses and mm. not learn from it. Um, I don't sure. think market cares about us that yeah. much. It's a very powerful thing. Oh, okay. So besides mountaineering and trading, I think a lot of our viewers know you from writing the book, How to Day Trade for a Living. Could you tell us a little bit about that? What inspired you to write the book? Yeah, so first of all, I have to say that when I wrote the book, and it was late 2015, mm. I was not a great trader. I was kind of trading, mm -hmm. but I was not a great trader. Okay. When I started trading, I, I wanted to learn day trading, okay, what it is. So I went to the different chat rooms, the YouTube channels, Mm. And uh, I started watching videos uh, from a lot of people, a lot of big traders, good traders. And then I got inspired and said, OK, why not there is a book that specifically tells all of these details step by step for me? There was mm. a lot of blogs. There was a lot of videos. But there was no step by step guide. Mm. And then as a PhD, uh, <laughs> I decided to write that book because that's what I learned as a PhD student. Yeah. Is as a PhD, they give you an unknown topic and then mm. th you have to research about it. And then in research, you go through the literature, you see what is available, you propose the question, you do the experiment, and then you finish it by publishing your papers and thesis and defend it in front of uh, you know, a, a examination, mm. a examining committee. And then that book was uh, very naturally was exactly the same process. I said, okay, I'm gonna study it myself. I did, and I said, okay, I found it. These are the tests, okay, these are the charts. These are my examples. I used to have a blog that posts all of my trades in there as a journaling. Oh, okay. to, you know, I was using it as a journaling. And then I started writing it. And mm. I wrote the, the first version was very small and uh, and then I defended that. I published that and now, you know, went to a YouTube channel, put the recaps and everything. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be successful because, first of all, I think it was a good right timing for it because mm -hmm. everybody wanted to learn, but there was no good book. Mm -hmm. And then the second of all was that it was written by someone who was going through the pain of the learning trading themselves. Mm -hmm. If I was a Very big true. trader in Wall Street, I might have written that book differently because no one would understand no that one book. would understand yeah. that but i was going through the pain of understanding that what is this vvap what is the platform or how mm. do i put this moving average in there or what's the point of this so because i went through that i think it was very successful it resonated with a lot of people mm. and because i self-published the book uh, I got the chance to update it a couple of times. That's also a big thing because if you go with the publisher, it's a little bit hard to uh, to get uh, to to get the updated versions out. Oh, okay, interesting. So I actually read the book many years ago. So recently, I, I reread the book. I, I have the audio book actually. So I re mm. re listened to it, and I you know I you know I got a lot of insights from that. So knowing now what you know. So many years later, because the first version of the book was 2015, you said. Yeah. How would you revise it? How would you update it now, today? I think, uh, and I am actually going to update it. Mm -hmm. I think what I would do differently is, uh, in the book, I was explaining about the strategies. Mm -hmm. And there are different strategies that I trade. Uh, 
in the new version, I want to emphasize more like building a trade book. And the trade book is a little bit more important than a strategy. Like opening mm -hmm. range breakout is a strategy. Mm -hmm. But how you actually execute that and mm -hmm. what are the criteria from a stock selection, from trade execution, from trade identification, mm -hmm. uh, and all of those stuff. So I try to put more uh, elements of how actually you execute that strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my book right now, I explain the st strategies, but I don't spend too much time on how to actually execute that. Mm, uh, okay. So I want to, you know, revise it with more hands-on uh, mm. tips about how to actually execute that. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So it's kind of like a step number two for yeah, the traders. Exactly. Step number one is reading a book at it is now, and you're providing step two, like leveling up a little bit with mm. execution. More hands-on, exactly. Mm. Yeah. So you can explain to them the strategies to forever, mm -hmm. but you have to also walk them through uh, examples. Like one section that I want to add in the new edition is actually to put some my recent to, uh, examples that, okay, this is a step one, this is how I found it, this is how I executed, this is how I made a mistake. So to show them more real life examples, like mm -hmm. kind of the recaps that we are doing on YouTube, mm -hmm. but in more written version that people understand a step by step better. Oh, yeah, I like that. I think that's a great idea, actually. Yeah, I like think the that's thought good. process, whether it's a win or loss from start to finish, how you planned it, especially. I yeah. think trade planning is probably the most difficult part yeah. to learn as a trader. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, how many uh, trade books you have or playbook, people call it differently? Essentially, how many strategy do you trade? I have on the big picture, I have five or six. And then a lot of times, it's like variations of each mm -hmm. one of them. Yeah, there are certain ones where I'll tweak the entry for a certain market environment. Or if it's like a small cap stock, I might, you know, have the entry a lot higher. But overall, big picture is the same. Mm -hmm. So I have around six. Do you have name for each of those strategies? Yeah, I do. May I ask? Sure. Uh, I have one that I talked about on the channel called uh, the gap up reversal mm -hmm. long. So that one specifically for obviously stocks that gap up and I'm looking for a reversal after like did the profit taking mm -hmm. move. Another one, like the short side, I have like, this one called the extension short. Uh, the the ideas in the name when the stocks, I really extend it on a daily, I short it on the first red day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like generally the big picture idea. Oh, very nice. Yeah. So that's how I, I personally do it. I categorize them. Into that's good. Different it's very books. important. I think yeah. people should give name to the strategies mm. uh, because it gives that a strategy a character. So you yeah. actually treat it well. Like I have, uh, like, for example, your gap up reversal mm -hmm. is uh, something that I call the double bottom reversal. Mm. So it's a, I th I'm pretty sure it should be the same because okay. I'm looking also the stock guy gapping up. First drop, you see some sort of a sign of a strength mm -hmm. and then you try to catch that reversal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing that, for example, two traders can see the same strategy, but yeah. they name it differently. They execute it differently. They mm -hmm. put their own DNA and fingerprint inside that strategy. Yeah. And that's the beauty of the market. Yeah. Because you cannot follow another person uh, strategy. No. You have to personalize it. Yeah. Like you and I, we can hand people the exact same strategy we play, play. If that doesn't fit their personality or risk profile, it's not going to work for them. Exactly. Like they have to really get the big picture idea. And like they can take a piece and pieces like from you, from me, and then they, they tweak it. So like it fits how they trade in their own style. Yeah, yeah. Or they may like trade the other side. Like when we look for the profit taking, they may take the shorts. Yeah, and we're down do. there looking for a long. Well, that happens a yeah. lot uh, in our community. Like uh, Brian that you met, mm -hmm. which we, Brian and I are trade at the same time live. Mm. And sometimes one stock, we completely trade in the opposite direction. Oh. And at the end of the day or at the end of the session, both of us are profitable. Because mm. it's very important that more than the direction that you choose, the trade management mm -hmm. is... Uh, you know, defining if you are successful or not. Mm. Like I might short it for five seconds. He might take a long for a five minutes period. Mm. And at the end yeah. of the day, both of us are uh, successful. And that's amazing to see how one stock can give so many opportunities mm -hmm. for so for many sure. traders. Yeah. As long as there's volume. Uh, as yeah. long as volatility <laughs> and yeah, volume. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's very true. Yeah. But, but there's more than one way to make money in the market. Yeah, 100%. So I think you're right. That's the beauty of this market. That's yeah. what, that's why it's so uh, you know exciting for me every morning that mm. it's it's just like solving a puzzle every morning like okay how we can figure out this thing of the market today and mm. I like that uh, more than money I like the, the mental 
uh, challenge or stimulation. It's like gamers. Like I think, especially day trading is very similar to gaming. A lot of the gamers are, you know, you have to press at the right time at the, mm-hmm. you know, have to figure those steps, and it, that mental uh, s- uh, stimulation for day traders is very important. And it's also dangerous too because it can very be like dangerous. gambling. Yeah. yeah. But I like, I think most of all, I like the challenge. And like you said, it's like a game where you can be there trying to figure out the challenge and then you almost instantly see whether you're rewarded or you're punished for it. Yeah. So like it's, it's, a, it's like, I know it's, it's not good, like instant gratification yeah. or instant loss. That's like you how, see yeah. the, the results of your, of your you know, hard working, whether you were right or wrong. That's, uh, that's how it actually can be dangerous too, gambling mm. exactly like that, that yeah. instant gratification mm-hmm. that you try to chase that uh, uh, high. But generally, I love the fact that you can get the result of your decisions in a matter of minutes mm. i like that you know swing traders when they take a trade you have to be patient investors yeah. decades of uh, <laughs> staying ah, i'm not that person <laughs> so you don't invest i do okay. yeah well um but you just don't look at it or no nah, well some of my investments are in real estate okay and uh some of our my positions uh the the cash idle that i have mm. uh i bought an etf right now and i'm sitting on an etf just for income generation so i look mm. at it it's in my account mm-hmm. but uh yeah i just don't look at it it's in my idle cash and here's mm. the problem with day trading is as your day trading account gets bigger it becomes a little bit difficult to beat the market. Like if you have a $5 million account, mm-hmm. then you can't really, day, you can day trade, but it's how much you wanna make. You have to make $50,000 a day, to be good, but you have to put that money in work at least in an ideal passive uh, position. Yeah. Uh, so one of my accounts, I'm just buying and I have an ET- ETF, just uh, getting 12% uh, a dividend from it. Mm. I, uh, I feel the same, but for me, I like to keep my trading account a manageable size and keep them separate and and i'm not saying everyone should do this but i do this i i take the cash i have i kind of i know people are always saying oh you shouldn't like you should just manage it yourself invest it yourself but i don't want to because i know i like you know my hands i I love to go in and out of the trades so i give it to someone else to manage it how much is your trading account may i ask in the Feel free to cut it out, so later. Six figures. Six figures. Yeah, yeah six nice. figures. Yeah. So how much? Do you, so six figures or mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands. Okay, not yeah. million. No. 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 Okay. no I, if I do that, I think if my trading account is that big, I do stupid things. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think you know I've come to realize that as a trader, I'm the number one biggest threat to my trading account. So you know, it's also part of like, do I ever want to risk? losing half of a $1 million account. Not really. So that's why I keep at six figures. It's still a significant amount to make enough money. But if I lose all of it, hope it doesn't happen. But if I one day I lose my entire account, it's not gonna wipe me out. Uh, do you trade with a seven figure account then? Yeah, my account is seven figure. Are you, were you, are you ever worried? Well, last year I had a $2 million loss. $2 million dollar yeah, loss? I, I, I think a, I saw it in your YouTube video. Yeah, I had a really bad. I was live in front of everybody. It's just, uh, but I got uh, I got some of it back from tax returns. So oh, okay. I, I get $500,000 back from tax returns. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So I didn't know the CRA wrote me a check on Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god but that's a that's a nice check i don't think i've ever gotten that much return yeah hopefully you don't CRA. get that much of, get i've never gotten anything back from, okay cannot talk about cra here no but the good thing about the trading i don't know how mm-hmm. you do your taxes my taxes are you know the trading income is a business income for me so it has over to the be, years yeah. um uh, yeah because we yeah. do a lot so you pay taxes, and mm-hmm. then when you have such a bad loss, you can actually carry back to three years, mm-hmm. and then you get it back. Yeah. Um, so I got it back because in the last you know ten years I paid so much taxes, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> I like how positive you are. Yeah. Well, I, it was really hard. I mean, the, I closed that position in May two in 2022, last 2022. year, May, almost okay. a year ago. Okay. And it was really bad. I was I was feeling really bad, but I recovered most of it. So. Uh, plus that five hundred thousand dollar tax return <laughs> yeah. helped a lot, so I mm-hmm. kind of mentally moved on. But at one point, I said I probably better stop trading. I was really that bad. 
Was it a day trade from one day? It was a day trade that I turned it to a swing trade, <gasps> which is the oh, mistake no. that most oh, of the no. people do, that you're not accepting the loss. Yeah. It just keeps going down. You keep adding to that. And okay. then you eventually lose that. All of my big losses have always been averaging down on a losing position. Uh-huh. And the biggest one was the one that actually I just kept also uh, overnight. Do you, do you remember? Of course you remember the ticker. Yeah, it was TNA. TNA? Yeah, it's a leveraged ETF. For oh, it's leveraged. Oh. <laughs> Risky business, Andrew. Weapons of mass destruction. Oh my uh, God. You can make a lot it. if it goes in your favor, but holy that's, a, that's what I was exactly thinking. I, w- I bought it at the, uh, I don't know, at the price that I bought, I was thinking of, well, if it goes up, then I'm set for life. Like a private jets and Lambos <laughs> and everything, bring it up. But it just can't come. And it's always the opposite. It goes oh down. Oh my God. <laughs> leverage ETF. Well, leverage what? Uh, what, what, uh, it's, what? Uh, it was uh, IWM is an index. Okay. You trade IWM? Uh, I, don't, I don't touch the ETFs much. Yeah. I use it to, I look at it as I trade individual stocks, but I try not to trade the ETFs. So IWM yeah. is an index that is 2,000 micro cap companies. In okay. There. And TNA is uh, the, the three times leverage of that on a daily basis. So meaning that if IWM goes up 1%, uh-huh. this one goes up, uh, 3%. Go, 3% go yeah. up, and, and the, the vice versa. Okay. And the, the big one, the famous one is TQQQ. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's a very similar. It's the same company that is mm. offering that. So okay. that one is tracking QQQ. Okay. So you were long biased on it? I was long biased. Oh, okay. And... Uh, so I got that in there, and IWM in the matter of three months dropped twenty percent. So that means yeah. my position dropped sixty percent. Yeah, small caps got destroyed yeah, last destroyed, year. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that was a, I had a very big position. I had like almost like almost yeah, it was a three million dollar position that I eventually closed it at one million dollars, so a two million dollar loss. Oh my god. Yeah. Did you was it? Did you plan on having, is that your regular size or is it after like you keep on adding? No, I, I kept adding on that. That's oh, a good okay. question. I kept adding on that. Oh. Originally, I wanted to have just $1 million position. Uh-huh. Just $1 million. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. I mean, it's doable. $1 million, mm-hmm. it's not that crazy because you use margin. I use margin all the time for mm-hmm. day trading. My, my positions, like on Tesla, for example, at today, I traded like up six, 7,000 shares. And mm-hmm. it's, yeah. Two hundred dollars, near two hundred dollars. So mm-hmm. my position was worth two to one million dollar. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, I use margin as well. Yeah. So you can right. go on a three to one margin and mm. track your brokers. Do you trade the actual st- uh, equity or you trade options on these? Well, I do both. I recently mm. got into the options for the type of trade that I do. Options mm-hmm. are a little bit tricky because for at the open opening range breakouts, mm-hmm. if you want to get to the options, you have to bring the option chain really fast. You have to be ready. It's and very then you select volatile. This track and then yeah. you have to volatile and then the spreads are bad. And sometimes buying the shares are much easier. But today, mm. for example, I shorted the Tesla. And then I also shorted some calls, uh, option calls as well, mm. because I had time and the level was clear and everybody in the chat room was shorting it. And I said, OK, I'll short it as well. Mm. Um, so both. But I mostly shares. OK. And I know it's not very capital efficient, but mm. I, I like that. It really I, I'm really good at uh, doing it. Yeah, I think that's also the reason I prefer shares. I, get, I thought about like dabbling into options, but I just like the fact that, you know, it's easy to get filled. Yeah. When, when you're trading shares. Like yeah. it's something like Tesla, at the open, the volume is so high that you can get in and Anything, out really yeah. quick. Yeah. So after hearing what Andrew just said about stocks versus options, what's your opinion? Would you prefer to trade one or the other? Let me know in the comment section below. Are you comfortable talking about your losses in front of people? Yeah, originally I wasn't, because mm-hmm. that's very embarrassing, you know, because people coming and say, oh, this Andrew dude lost $2 million, blah, blah, blah. And then after after a while, I realized that, okay, you know, everybody knows that, and I should talk mm. about it. And, uh, you know, there's a lesson for myself more than anyone else. And if that helps anybody mm. who l- listens to that, then so be it. You know, people don't average down on your losing position. Mm. Averaging down works most of the time but that one time that doesn't work it can destroy your life yeah like i'm young and i got lucky to recover that from loss but a lot of people can recover from that kind of mm-hmm. loss and this is serious so i think uh yeah i think i'm comfortable t- speaking of, of it. Mm-hmm. for me i think 
where I used to average into adding to losers, but I used to do it a lot on the other side, on the short side. Whereas, because I used to trade a lot of low float stocks and I'll just short them all the time. And I'll even swing short them. Yes, with the intention of swing shorting. But at that one time you had the stock going from $5 to $40 to $60. That's, that's, that's usually up, how I uh, yeah. blew up, blow up in my first couple of years. So one question that I ask, uh, I've mm -hmm. been, I'm being asked a lot, uh, and I want to ask you, what's the difference between averaging in into a position or average down on a losing position? Yeah, so the way I trade is I only add if it's already going in my direction. So let's say if I'm long, it's already like going higher. Like you're seeing higher lows and you see profit target, let's say it's, for example, Tesla, let's say my target is $200. It's already setting in that uptrend. Then when it dips to 170, let's say I have an average of 170. I add into like 172, 173. So I'm adding higher. So that's how I trade. So in my case, you know, when I add to a loser, it will be if the stock, let's say, break down 170, mm -hmm. I add at 179, 170, sorry, 169, 170, 168, 165. That's averaging to a loser. Nice. Yeah. So you always average into the direction of your trade. Yeah. Good. Especially after it's like confirmed that, okay, like it's, it's this is an uptrend. Let's go. Yeah. That's very nice. Good. Thanks. Good to know. <laughs> no, that's just the way I trade. Like, I'm sure people have different ways of yeah, have, scaling yeah. into the trade. Yeah, everyone has like their own style. How would you tell our audience, like on a big picture, what's your um, strategy? Like you mentioned the opening range breakout a lot. Could you explain to everyone, big picture wise, what, what is that strategy? So that strategy is when your stock is, uh, first of all, it has to be in play. So it means uh, gapping up or gapping down or mm -hmm. have very significant amount of volume. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work on any stock. Like if you give me a random ticker like Ford today, it doesn't work probably. So it has to be something that has some fundamental news on it, like Tesla. Mm -hmm. like Tesla today was the earning yesterday mm -hmm. and uh, that activity. So I look at the stock is tr how it's trading at the pre-market. Is it trading above WeWap, which is a volume weighted average price, or mm -hmm. below that? If this stock is a, uh, squeezing above the WeWap and shows them a strength in the first minute or five minutes, then I can take that trade into the direction of uh, of the breakout. So that would be five minutes. So look at the first candlestick, five minute. If it's bullish above the VWAP, you go long, you mm. put the stop loss below the VWAP and you try to get to the breakout of uh, pre-market high or the mm. next uh, technical level that you have. Okay. And the short would just be the opposite. Short would be the opposite. Mm -hmm. I like to go long on the stocks that are gapping up and okay. I like to go short on the stocks that are gapping down because mm. then you have the you know tailwind with mm -hmm. you because the stocks are gapping up for a reason and yeah. gapping down for a reason however you always have to look at the opening lock price action yeah. because like tesla today was gapping down but opened very strong for half an hour it was just ripping higher mm -hmm. and then after that uh, the trend changes so very important to see at the opening price plus where is the trading compared to the vwap that's mm -hmm. the most important indicator that i use Above the VWAP means the stocks are strong. Below the VWAP are weak. Mm -hmm. So you try to go short below the VWAP, go long above the VWAP. Mm. Do you ever trade any of the small cap stocks or just stick with the no, big caps? No, I, dis I stopped uh, trading anything less than $10 a long time ago. Like the mm. last time that I traded them was 2020 during the pandemic. Mm. I, 2021, 2022, I n never touched them and I don't plan to touch them mm. at all. Uh, because there are different crowd of the people who are trading them. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, so the indicators would be different. The price action is different. Uh, it's just not the area that I want to get in there. Plus, we are in a bear market. That kind of we are in a bear market, and the volatility on the market and a lot of these big names are good enough. Mm -hmm. Plus, when your account is getting bigger, you can make meaningful return from Apple or yeah. NVIDIA and higher price. Mm -hmm. But for the small uh, uh, traders, a little bit difficult. That's mm -hmm. why they're more intended toward the penny stocks because uh, the return could be more significant there. Mm. Yeah, those are really good points, actually. Yeah, I, I, I'm trading a lot more large caps this year and last year because small caps, just way too many games. Like I look at my P&L, my profit and losses, some of my biggest losses prior to 2021 all came from small caps. So that's when I decided, okay, if I just remove trading that kind of stocks, you know, I still trade them by size down and I like, only like trade them like less than 10% of my trades are small caps now. Yeah, if I just remove this kind of stock in 
together, I'll be a lot more profitable, make a lot more money. Yeah,、it's、a lot a, of times it's about just about removing the biggest losses. Then you're you're good.、Yeah. It's an evolution of <laughs>、yeah. a trade. There, you would、mm-hmm. be you would be surprised how you would be evolved in ten years. Like I, ten、mm-hmm. years ago when I started, I didn't know that I trade like this today. Mm. Uh, so th- that's the evolution. Like for example, you said options. If you get more into this big caps, th- the more you would realize that oh, options are actually very powerful because、mm-hmm. uh, penny stocks don't have option chain,、mm-hmm. so you can't really trade the options on them. But Apple, Tesla, AMD, NVIDIA, market S P S and P five hundred, everything has option chain.、Mm-hmm. And then when you realize that okay, there are some opportunity to trade options when the price action is choppy. Like、mm-hmm. we can't make money when the price action is choppy. But if you sell the options or you trade the options, even on the choppiness, you can make really good money. So,、mm-hmm. uh, options, I think, is a more natural evolution for people who stick around for、uh, large cap.、Um, so, tell us about what your routine is like as a trader here in Vancouver.、Uh, I wake up、uh, usually around five thirty. Okay. And I try to be at by the office by six fifteen. And、uh, when I'm waking up and making the coffee and everything, I watch the, the pre-market show that. Uh, people are running on YouTube,、mm. so my team are running the pre-market show, and sometimes I go see other、uh, channels. There is one newsletter that I'm reading is very interesting、uh, from Bloomberg、mm-hmm. uh, that comes right around 5:30 in my inbox.、Mm. It says five things to start,、uh, five things to know to start your trading day. So it's a summary of what's happening in the market and with some commentary. I like that. It's very short.、Mm-hmm. Uh, it's from Bloomberg. Uh, and then by try six fifteen, which is nine fifteen on the trading hour, I try to be in behind the station. Okay. And most of my trading is done by ten thirty,、uh, which is、uh, sorry seven thirty our time、oh, would be ten thirty、yeah. uh, on the Eastern time. Okay. And then after that, I go for a run.、Uh, I used to do the run before、uh, trading, but、mm-hmm. I kind of changed that、uh, as I'm getting older. I just I need more sleep,、mm-hmm. so I do the run usually b- between nine、uh, to ten, nine to ten thirty. Okay. Get back home, shower, change, eat breakfast,、uh, and then yeah, go back to the office、mm. and continue working. Okay, so you really only trade from nine thirty to sorry Eastern to ten thirty. So one hour a day. One、now. hour. Yeah. Oh, very yeah. optimized. Yeah, seventy-five、yeah. percent of eighty percent of my trades are done by ten thirty. Hmm. Uh, rarely I stay after eleven, like、mm. uh, thirty hours. So I I don't like that. It's not my style. I suck at it.、Uh, I don't want to be around. I don't. I just want to enjoy my life. I don't want to. I don't care、mm-hmm. the, about the, what market does. I think it's good. A lot of traders think full-time trading means sitting at the trading desk the entire day, but a lot of times that's actually how you lose all your morning profits. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's getting choppy, and you know. It's not fun, really, trading in the afternoon. I've never found it. Sometimes there are things, there breaking news coming, or some of these penny stocks,、mm-hmm. and sometimes some activity happens. But like life, you can't chase everything. You have to accept that okay, there are things that is happening, and you're not part of it. I like that. Yeah. 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 So what about in the evenings? Do you have any evening routine to prep for the next day? No, for trading wise,、mm-hmm. no. I am not. Uh, uh, I kind of feel embarrassed to say that, but. When I'm finishing my day, doesn't impact anything in the market. Really, doesn't impact me until、mm. the next day. Cause I'm more like a chart pattern trader, and、mm-hmm. I look at those opening range breakouts. So the fundamentals of what's happening behind the market really doesn't、uh, change my bias.、Mm. If anything, it might actually impact me. Like today, for example, I wanted to short Tesla because the results of the earning was bad. And it was difficult to short Tesla at the open, <laughs>、right. but that bias helps you. So I wish actually last night I didn't look at the、uh, earning result.、Mm. Uh, so I try not to really do that. There is one really nice、uh, newsletter that I read. It's from、uh, Stock Tweets. Okay. And I like that.、Uh, it's a very nice uh, short uh, what's happening in the market, and I like、mm. that. Sometimes I read that. Okay, so what time do you go to bed to be able to wake up at five thirty? I usually go at nine. Okay,、uh, nine nine thirty. You know, all of my friends know that. You know, during the weekday, I'm the party pooper, so they know <laughs> that. Oh, I'm gonna go at nine. Goodbye. Nobody bothers me. You're gonna be、me. that guy <laughs>、yeah. who leaves the party. I'm always、nine. that guy. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm that person too, actually. <laughs> I think it's good that you're able to kind of really separate your own life and from trading. So, so it doesn't. You don't let like let's say like a bad day or a really good good winning day kind of affect the rest of your your day. Has it always been like that? No,、know? I think、uh, over time,、uh, 
I think over time you realize, uh, first of all, you need a certain amount of uh, success in trading to have that cushion for losses. Like mm. it's really at the beginning, like when your account is going down, and most of the people are like that, that hockey curve that you go down and then go up, it's very difficult. Mm. But after that, like I'm at a certain stage of my trading that $2 million and $2 million and $5,000 really doesn't matter that much. Mm. Like when you reach that level, everything else has become real. The money loses its value. Mm -hmm. So the bad loss, if it's not like a $2 million loss that wipes out 50% of the account, it, you know, it's just a loss. You know, you make it another day. And I've reached after 10 years that uh, to this point that the market is just getting better and better. Like the volatility is getting better and better. I'm getting better and better. And there's always a chance to make it up. Like mm -hmm. if this was a you know, party like for one week, you know, it's like Burning Man or Coachella. You think, <laughs> oh, I got to use it. It's going to finish, going to end. But the market is just forever. So oh. if I have a bad day, tomorrow is another day, another day, and another day. So not having a FOMO for me is that I know tomorrow is going to be another mm. day. And if this not ticket, it's going to be another one. Yeah, I think as traders, like you said, the most important thing, thing is just to survive and trade another day. Yeah, survive. Very important, especially at the beginning. A survival mm. at the beginning is very, very difficult. Like like a baby, like if baby, a toddler ever started walking, it's very important that doesn't fall, you know, mm. the stairs or doesn't, you know, nothing bad happens. But as you start walking and you learn that, it's just everything becomes so mm. easier. And, as a baby grow up, they they do more extreme things like mountaineering, mountaineering climbing. Yeah. <laughs> it's calculated Skiing. risk, yes, but these are calculated yes. risks, like trading. Uh -huh. You know, I actually did publish an article about uh, mountaineering and climbing. Oh yeah. Uh, so, they're, but they're the same thing. You take risks, mm -hmm. but it's calculated risks. Mm. Uh, like climbers use the rope to try, try to avoid the avalanche, the best weather, and you know, security in place. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a, still a risk, but it's not uncalculated. Mm. It's like trading. You take a place a trade and you know, make sure that the risk is controlled. Um, do you think since you become a full time trader now, you've been trading for more than 10 years, has your trading ever affected your personal life? Like your, how your family, friends approach you or how, how like you may come across this to other people or like your loved ones? I think so. To some extent, yeah. Um, I mean... When I became very successful in trading in 2020 mm. and 2021, early 2021, I was feeling, you know, I was not humbled. Like, I was not a humble. I was <laughs> far from being humble. I was feeling just invincible. Like, I figured this thing out. Nothing would stop me. I'm going to be a billionaire soon until market really humbled me down and said, you know, just uh, just keep it keep it down mm. uh, so it did impact my relationship with other friends as well so I was feeling oh I'm successful I can make money yeah I replace you I don't want you I, you know mm. and you know it does it did impact me to some extent until it really humbled me and realized that okay the money the fa as fast as it comes it can go away faster it's mm. just you're one bad trade away from just being broke mm. and that was a big eye-opening lesson for me so actually now I see friendships value that I make with people, you know, you can't replace mm -hmm. it with money. Uh, when I was trading, uh, I was married and my previous uh, wife, she never asked any question about the result of my trading. That's good. You know, and that was yeah. really important. And mm. I really, really value that because it's very stressful to explain to people on a you know, daily or monthly basis. Oh, I lost this amount of money because mm. the money that a lot of people are trading is the money that they are risking for their family. And I've had mm. a trader came to me and said, I have this, uh, you know, paradox that I want to trade for my family, but I also have to risk the family saving. And I don't yeah. I can't put these two together. And I understand that, uh, mm. you know, as especially as you know, you get older and you have more family commitments and the kids and the college funds and stuff. So um, for me, personally, family was very important to supportive. And by their support was not asking any question, my ex-wife. Mm. Uh, and I think that's very important. And my mom also never asked how much uh, I make or I lose. And I mm -hmm. actually try to avoid her to know that. <laughs> but she recently <laughs> figured out my YouTube channel. So oh, she no. goes and watch she's my YouTube channels. And yeah, she's unfortunately. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, no. So, yeah, I have to change the channel. Uh, <laughs> but overall, no, I think, uh, I think people around me stayed the same. Mm, uh, I, I try to change a little bit uh, mm -hmm. but uh, you know people around me 
you know, still still the same, and you know, they're genuine. They like me for who I am, mm -hmm. not what I make or what I lose. And that's very important to stay to the core values and friendships that you have mm. during trading. Because when I actually had that bad loss, my brother, who the closest person to me, helped me to recover mentally from that. Mm. Is he a trader? Yeah, he's a trader. Oh. He's a really good trader, yeah. He's more trading options, but he's a really good trader. Mm. His background is finance, and so he's, he knows a lot of stuff about markets. Oh, smart family. We have PhD here, finance guy there. Because we are from Iran. In Iran, I always push you toward the school. Go study, go study. It's oh. just, you know, it's very uh, tradition that people in Iran, in, I mean, uh, India is also the same way. There are a lot of countries they push you toward the school. And that's mm. very typical in Iran. Yeah, it's like that in Taiwan too. You either become an engineer like you, a doctor, doctor. or a lawyer, or a disgrace to the family. <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah. That's exactly Those like Those are Iran. the options. Yeah. There's no, nothing else. Iran, the lawyers, they don't really uh, encourage lawyers, but a medical doctor or mm. engineer. And that's why I, I'm chemical engineer because Iran had a lot of oil and gas and chemical mm. engineer was a good field. Oh, uh, it's not as big as big as here, but uh, mm -hmm. in that time it was oil and gas. Go to oil and gas, the engineer. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. Oh, but you never considered working. Like you, you don't want to go back, obviously. But I don't think I can. Mm -hmm. I don't think I, I don't think I can go back to corporate life. Sometimes I'm thinking that if I don't trade, what would I do? But. I guess I have to retire if I don't trade because I don't think I can go back to nine to five. I don't think you look like you can retire. That's also true. Like, I mean, like <laughs> your personality wise, you don't look like you can retire and do nothing. That's yeah. usually what people say when they say That's retire, also, right? People who retire too early die. That's what mm, I found. Yeah. My, di my dad retired too early and he died uh, very early. Oh. A lot of people are our family because we have to do something. We have to keep fighting for something. Yeah. The people who retired early they just get covid and just get sick and mm. die and i really believe that what we do is a, is the purpose of our life it's like sharks they, they cannot stop swimming yeah. if they stop they actually die yeah that's yeah. a good point i think that's true <laughs> we might have to fact check that <laughs> 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 no i saw it on my <laughs> The National Geo anyways, National Geograph. Hope you guys been enjoying this conversation between Andrew and I. We talked about a lot of interesting topics. If you have any questions, whether it's trading or non-trading related for Andrew, make sure to leave them in the comment section below. And uh, I'll tag him and he can go and answer your questions. What, would, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Knowing what you know now, having all the market and life experience, what would you say? Trading wise or life wise? Uh, Both. Let's well, start with trading. Uh, trading wise, I would uh, advice would be definitely uh, stick with the, the larger caps. Mm -hmm. Don't mess around with the lower float. Under ten dollars, anything not under ten dollars and low float, like mm -hmm. anything less than 30, 20 million shares float, stay away from them. There's so much money to be made not touching them. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would be that trading advice. The life advice would be uh, don't take your life too seriously. Like, you know, money comes and goes. Money was always very important for me. Mm. Like I was come, I come from a family of nothing and, you know, just making money was a thing for me. Mm. And then, I, you know, I, uh, you have to make it and then realize that it's not really bringing you happiness and it's not that everything. Mm. And uh, as a business wise, if I want to tell as a business advice, uh, life to myself is understand the business cycles. Mm -hmm. Like the, the capitalism system goes through the cycles of the expansion and the retraction. And uh, I didn't know that. You know, mm. I was I, I grew up in the zero interest rate environment from 2009 to 2022. Mm -hmm. It's just a different environment. And now we are into entering, a, you know, a different cycle of the business that everything is contracting, interest rates are getting up. Yeah. And a lot of business people, you have to be ready for those cycles. So the advice when you understand the business cycles that. Mm. Uh, what would you tell to new traders? Any tips for them starting out? Trading a simulator, it's the most important thing that I have to tell people. It's so exciting to, I have seen so many people who are opening up an account and mm -hmm. start trading without a simulator. 
That you, mm. you wouldn't do that with driving. You wouldn't do it with so many other things. How could you just start opening up an account and start buying these uh, zero day to expiry options? No, don't. Oh you God, trade on yeah. a simulator, develop that plan, it's three months consistency. That's the most important thing. And uh, I think the, just surviving the game of trading is very important. That's what mm. I want to tell the new traders that try to survive the game. This is a game that it takes a few years to master. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not a get rich quick. No, it's scheme. not. I know it's very cliche. Everybody yeah. says that. But here, read the stories. Like, watch this video. The people who are watching this video until to the end, you know, you've gone through a lot of things about my story. So you know that it's not easy. And another thing is that mm -hmm. there are a lot of people asking me, okay, Andrew, when am I, how long it takes for me to become a consistently profitable trader? The answer to that is never. There is no date that you say, okay, I made it from now on, it's downhill. No. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a very experienced trader. I had a really bad loss, $2 million loss. You know, you always have like a diet. You always have to watch your diet to make sure that you stay healthy. There is no point in your life that you say, okay, I'm fit and this is it. Mm. No, it's just a work in progress every single day. You're one decision away from a very bad trade and, you know, a disaster. Thank you for those tips. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think our audience really needs it. What would yeah. you tell yourself uh, if you go back 10 years? Going back 10 years. Wow. I think... I kind of wish I left college. I wish I didn't go to college, to be honest. I spent four years, wasted a lot of money. You know, I wish I spent the money in other kind of education. It could be trading, it could be something else. I was in film. I wish I spent the money, you know, just learning more practical, um, actual hands-on experience rather than going to college. I think that's what I would tell myself. Uh, I so wouldn't have listened. I know that. But <laughs> don't you think that the college that you went had impacted your success as a good content creator? Yes, but I don't think I need a four years for that. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, a year and a half or two years would have been enough. I could have left and still have the same exact same editing and storytelling uh, skills. Yeah, but it's a good point. I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I you know, studied film and went to VFX. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, where can everyone find you if they want to find you on social media? So I'm in all social media. Uh, search Andrew Aziz or Bear Bull Traders, like the animal, bear market, bull market, bear bull traders. <laughs> so at bear bull traders, pretty much all of my social media are there. And I try to comment in under this video mm -hmm. so people can see if. Yeah, I'll tag you too. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, thank, thank, you thank, you. So thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. And I give a shout out to the people in the behind the scene. Nobody see these guys yeah uh, we have daniel and then yeah. we have jean <laughs> yeah just of the leave, it in the, team. <laughs> leave this in the final edit video because i've always watched your video uh -huh. and i was always thinking it's you doing this but there's actually people are doing a lot i of actually things. do nothing i just show out and talk <laughs> 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 these other people <laughs> making it happen <laughs> awesome thanks guys thank you uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed my conversation with andrew remember it's free to smash the like button and it's also free to leave me a five-star review wherever you find your podcast thank you guys so much for watching us always i'm the humble trader and i'll see you guys next time